Take a young Germans of the Living Dead by Basilides of Alexandria, the city where East meets West. A group of Christian pilgrims set out from Alexandria to Jerusalem. They hoped that in the holy city they would be nearer to God than in a sin city on the Nile. But when they arrived in Jerusalem, Full of hope, they were bitterly disappointed. Besides the business with relics and holy rites, they could not find anything to satisfy their spiritual hunger. Their city with the holy fuss was too loud for them. There was there no breeze of spirituality. And so, disappointed and with an empty heart, they returned to Alexandria. Up to now, they had only believed in their God without feeling themselves eternally near to him. But face alone did not satisfy them. They felt that something was missing. They felt that themselves like living dead. Because their consciousness was half sunk in sleep. Only occasionally did they wake up for some moments only. Then they heard that in the vicinity there lived a teacher who had led many to inner peace. Basilides was his name. He was a master of a small community of knowers called Gnostics. He taught, face alone is not enough. It cannot set you free. Only the inner knowledge will save you. Desperately, these living dead went to him to become alive and to overcome their inner death. Basilides lived in a half-ruined ancient Egyptian temple with collapsed walls as the ancient knowledge was buried under the rubble of time. The living dead said to him, In Jerusalem we have found nothing that could have brought us to life. The fountain of the water of life has dried up a long time ago that could have woken us from spiritual death to life. We have heard that you are one who knows, one who has experienced God within himself. We don't want to believe only in God, we want to feel him within us. He should rise us from death to life. Teach us.
Vasilides asked. You are Christians? Yes, they admitted. Why do you come then to me? You Christians call me the teacher of errors. To whom else should we go then? In Jerusalem, the holy city, we did not find what we were searching for. You are on our own way home. They say that you as a Gnostic do not believe, but truly know. Vasilides said, we Gnostics have a different gospel. It contains no sweet Jesus stories. It contains the knowledge of what is hidden beyond the world, of which the Jewish God Yahweh knows nothing. Here, if you have ears to listen, with a moment movement of his hands, Basilius invited the living dead to sit down on some fallen pillars. Then he spoke. I begin with nothingness. At the beginning of everything, there was nothing but pure nothingness. Not even God was. That what would become God was hidden in nothingness. Then the non-existing God wanted to create a non-existing world with non-existing things. This non-existing world contained as a seed all other seeds, as the mustard seed contains the trunk, the branches and the leaves of the tree. Nothingness is the beginning of everything. Everything was created out of nothing. Nothingness is the same as fullness. In its infinity it is full and empty. Nothingness is both empty and full. It is and is not. It neither is nor is not. It is without qualities, since it has all qualities. In nothingness, thinking ceases, because nothingness allows well as all thinking. It is unthinkable. It is quite fruitless to think about nothingness because the more you enter nothingness, the more thinking ceases. The living dead asked, Why should we speak about nothingness when it is nothing? Basilius said, yes, about nothingness we cannot speak, only silence can express it. Nothingness is hidden in silence. But I speak of it with words, otherwise how could I teach you? that free you from the illusion that somewhere, either without or within, 
there is something lasting or definable but everything changes the living dead movement we use it to speak of it didn't you say there is no profit in thinking about nothingness I said that to you to free you from the delusion that we are able to think about nothingness. When we speak about nothingness, we have said nothing about it. However, speaking is necessary. Otherwise, how would you learn? If you are not true to your essence, you will not be whole, but fragmented. The dead asked. But if we strive to distinguish ourselves from others, are we not untrue to our essence? What is the harm in not distinguishing ourselves? Are we not all one? But Silvius said, when you don't distinguish yourself from others, you neglect your essence and fall into indistinctiveness and dissolve into nothingness. Because the ground of your essence is indistinctiveness. Every creature strives to distinguish itself from others. This is the fight against a dangerous sameness. Be yourself and not somebody else. Fullness and empty. Living and dead, difference and sameness, light and darkness, good and evil, beauty and ugliness, the one and the many. These pairs of opposites balance each other and annihilate each other in the nothingness. Keep away from qualities. You are neither this nor that. Then you will be free from all qualities. When you strive after the good or the beautiful, at the same time you create the evil and the ugly. But in nothingness, they are one with the good and the beautiful. Nothingness has no qualities. Thinking creates them. If, therefore, you strive for the difference or sameness for any qualities whatsoever, you fall into thinking, which pulls you out of the nothingness. Inasmuch as you run after these thoughts, you fall into thinking. Not your being creates distinctiveness, but you are thinking. At bottom, therefore, there is only one striving, namely the striving after your own being. If you had this striving, you would not need to know anything about the nothingness, and yet would you come to your goal. By the power of of your own being. With this, your thinking 
estranges you from your being. I must teach you that knowledge with which you may able to hold your thoughts in leash. In the night, the dead stood along the stone walls and moon. Tell us about God. Tell us where we can find God. We have searched him in Jerusalem, but we haven't found him there, not in heaven, nor on earth. Where is God? Where does he hide? We have heard. God is dead. Who has killed him? Mercy little said, God cannot be dead. Why? Because he never lived. God is a creature created by man. Man hangs many qualities on his God, like love, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing. Otherwise, he remains in the finite and in the terminable and ungraspable. Because the ground of his being is nothingness. The void is the essence of the devil. God and the devil are outflows of nothingness. As God and the devil are opposites, they balance each other in their effectiveness. They do not extinguish each other, but stand one against the other as effective opposites, opposites. They need no proof of their existence. It is enough that we always speak of them. Because of our constant speaking of them, they exist. Even if both were not, man would invent them anew because they cannot live without their mental fabrications, they would feel empty. To God always belongs the devil. Both are inseparable, because both came from nothingness. But above both is a God who unites fullness and emptiness. This is a God of whom you know mercy. His name is Abraxas. He stands above God and Abraxas is ineffective, effective, because he has no divine night effect. God has a divine effect, and so has the devil. Therefore, do they appear to us more effective than the indefinite Abraxas? At this point, the living dead raised a great tumult, for they were Christians and did not want to accept that their God was inferior to a praxis. Anyway, they begged, go on speaking to us about the supreme God, a praxis. But said, 
Praxis is a deity difficult to know because man perceives him not. In God, he sees only the highest good. In the devil, the profoundest evil. But from Praxis, he does not see anything because is nothing. Abraxas is eternally sucking words of the void. But what speaks is life. What the devil speaks is death. But Abraxas speaks at that used word which is life and death at the same time. Abraxas begets truth and lie, good and evil, light and darkness. Therefore, Abraxas is terrible and fertile. He is beautiful as a day of spring. He is a hermaphrodite. His abundance that Dunyai unites with emptiness. He is love and love's murder. He is a saint and his betrayer. He is the brightest light of day and the darkest night of madness. To look upon him is blindness. To know him is sickness. To worship him is death. To fear him is wisdom. Not to resist him is redemption. God dwells behind the night, the devil behind the night. But God brings force out of the light, the devil sucks it into the night. Upon every gift of God, the devil throws his colors. Everything that is begged from God becomes a deed of the devil. But Abraxas is the world. It's becoming and disappearing. That is the terrible Abraxas. In him man is afraid of himself he is a son's horror of the mother. He is the mother's love for the son. He is the delight of the earth and the cruelty of the heavens. Before his face man becomes like stone. Before him there is no question and no answer. He is the love of man. He is the speech of man. He is the appearance and the shadow of man. He is illusory reality. The dead were murmuring and said, Tell us more of gods and devils. Basilides said, Countless is the number of gods and devils. But woe unto you who have replaced his multiplicity by a single god. 
for in so doing, you mut mutilate the creature whose nature and aim is distinctiveness. You have reduced the many gods to just one god. But the same will be done unto you when your essence will be mutilated. The gods are mighty that can endure the multiplicity. For like the stars, they abide in solitudes, separated from each other by immense distances. But men are we. They cannot endure their multiplicity. Therefore they huddle together and seek society because they cannot bear their separateness. They become social. It is useless to worship the gods. You cannot achieve anything with your prayers. Their void swallows them all. The dead mocked and cried. The teachers of the church and the community of the believers. But Cyrilus said, Man is weak. Therefore he needs company. But company is distraction. Distinctiveness leads to singleness. Aloneness. Singleness is opposed to society. But because of man's weakness, society is needed. But too much society is evil. In society, everyone has to submit to others so that society may function. For you need. In singleness, man comes back to himself. It avoids the slavery of the masses. Society is shallow. Aloneness is profound. Society seems to give us warmth, but singleness gives us light. The living dead became silent and tried to understand. Then they spoke again. Ah, Cease this talk of gods. We knew that already. The living dead went to the half broken door and swarmed out into the dark night. But soon they came back again and said, We forgot something. Tell us something about man. Basilius said, Man is an open gate through which the outer world enters into his inner world. Small and transitory man in his innermost and the outmost in the praxis who creates and destroys the world is the goal of man. In him, man finds his rest. Toward him goes the long journey of the soul after death. But the greater world becomes cold, shines the inner star. Between man and his God, there should stand nothing. Man should not run away or turn away his eyes from the flaming spectacle of Abraxas. Don't 
become martyrs. Don't die for your face. Better live your face. Life is more valuable than any dogma. Don't believe in resurrection of the flesh. There is none. The flesh dies and rots. Only the spirit survives. <laughs> if it survives. The body returns to the earth. It is earth. That is natural. Keep this knowledge hidden. It is not for every year. I reveal it only to one out of a thousand. First learn silence. Only in silence will you experience it. Only when you have learned to be silent can you speak. Bear upon the dead fell silent and disappeared in the darkness like smoke.